Welcome everyone to the session on environmentally just best practices for carbon pricing and dividends. My name is Michael Howard and I'll be moderating this event. Uh, this session is brought to you with the generous support of our sponsors, which include the Gerald Huff Fund for Humanity, Humanity Forward Foundation, Aid Kit, and Steady. Before I begin, I'd like to give a brief overview on how to use Crowdcast. If you would like to submit a question to the speakers, please post in the ask a question function uh, near the bottom of the screen. Um, you may also vote on questions already posted by other attendees. This will help us to determine which questions to prioritize. Next, there's a chat box where you can hold side conversations. This is where we will also post any links and supplemental information. In order to keep things moving, we do not intend to respond to any activity in the chat. So please be sure to submit any questions using the ask a question function. Uh, now to introduce our speakers, um, the first speaker will be Mike Sandler. He is a sustainability professional and activist and manages several websites. Uh, he's co-founded several nonprofits, including the Climate Center based in Northern California in 20, 2001. Uh, he's the currently chair of the board of the Ireland-based Foundation for the Economics of Sustainability, or FASTA, and he's a former planning commissioner for the city of Sebastopol. Um, our second presenter will be Brent Rinaldi, um, who is a policy professional, a trustee at the sustainability think tank FASTA. Uh, he's the author of Commonwealth Dividends, History and Theory. Um, and our third presenter will be in absentia, uh, so Brent will be presenting for him, James Boyce, who is an economist at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and the author of The Case for Carbon Dividends. I'll now turn it over to Mike Sandler for the first presentation. Take it away, Mike. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we're really happy to be here. Um, and thanks to all folks on the West Coast who are up bright and early for this session. Um, Brent and I are, are on the East Coast, so it's not quite as early for us. Um, and Brent and I met at a NABIG con Congress in New York City uh, 2015, I believe, and we've been working together over the past few years. And there's going to be some overlap between the uh, my presentation and the two papers that Brent will present. Um, my presentation is about a website that I set up about 10 years ago and some of the ideas and implications of the process of capping and sharing the commons. The website is www.commons-share.org. Um, and the presentation is just an overview. So if you like it, please reach out to me afterwards and, and we can have a chat. I'm going to share my screen. And this is my first time doing this. So please bear with me. It should work. OK. And um, Brent or Michael, if you could tell me if you're able to see uh, the screen. That's good. You're able to see it? OK, great. So I'm just going to keep on going. Um, so how this came about um, is uh, I was working with Peter Barnes in California to promote cap and dividend as part of California's AB32 cap and trade program in 2007 or so. And that's also where I met Professor Jim Boyce, who is serving on a panel for the state of California. Um, I had met a British economist named Richard Douthwaite at a conference. And I found him to be pretty persuasive regarding the relationship between energy, money, the economy, and the environment. And Richard had founded the group FASTA, Foundation for the Economics of Sustainability, based in Ireland. And the word FASTA means in the future in Irish. And there's a poem about what will we do when all the forest is gone that has the word FASTA in it. Um, that's how they got the name. So I've been working with them for about 10 years now. And although and these ideas and opinions that you're going to hear are mine, but uh, we, we, I was inspired by some of these different groups. Okay, so why don't I just launch into it? Uh, we're going to talk about what is commons share and caps and shares and how it works, and then various types of shares, how we can apply that to different issues that are out there. Okay. So the principle is when a shared resource becomes limited, then the value that accrues from that scarcity should be returned to everyone equally. 
And the goal is to address major issues such as climate change, water scarcity in ways that also reduce economic inequality. And the way to do that is that higher users will pay for their use, the extra use, and conservers receive compensation. Um, and the context for all this is that in many cases, the commons are free and being plundered. There's no level playing field and there's no one in charge. And I just mentioned that Netflix movie, Don't Look Up, if any of you have seen that, um, that pretty much shows, you know, no one's in charge. Even if there's an asteroid hurtling towards Earth, people keep thinking someone's going to do something. <laughs> uh, wouldn't it be nice if there was a plan, a big solution that covered everyone and that was fair and we could say we're all in this together and it felt like someone was in charge. So that might be worth it to give up whatever freedom we have uh, around plundering as much commons as we want. So I already uh, mentioned some of my influences here. Uh, feel free to look up some of these folks. And I added Jim Boyce and Brent at the bottom there. They have some great books on the subject as well. And actually, Michael Howard has uh, books about Alaska Permanent Fund, also part of this whole uh, line of thinking. So how does it work? Here's the five steps that I've set out. First, you define the commons. Then you set a cap. You distribute shares that represent a portion under the cap. People sell those shares to the upstream regulated company. And the company raises prices, but conservers come out ahead. And I'll get a little more in depth into this. The, around distributing shares, that's a question. You know, there's different parts of these that you can do in different ways. Uh, I'll just mention it, this, this one idea, this approach of how to do it. Um, so for example, here's carbon share. This is the first one that, we, uh, that I came up with. And California sets a statewide cap. Um, then citizens receive a per capita share of the cap in the mail. The citizens cash the check uh, in banks or brokerages. So you're getting 15 tons CO2, you, there might be a price that day. Then the, the, um, there has to be some intermediary to sell that to the regulated company. So that's how, that's how the money changes hands. And that, that is, of course, if you have 36 million Californians, there might be high transaction costs. So that, that might be a reason to do a cap and dividend instead. But um, I'm just mentioning this as a, a particular approach and we'll talk about other resources that it can apply to. All right, so as I mentioned, cap and dividend. In the dividend approach, the government sells all the share, you know, all the uh, permits, allowances at once to the company and then just sends you a check, right? Cap and dividend, less transaction costs, and that's actually happening in various places in various ways around the world right now. Um, the share would be a little bit different because you get the share, but then you have to go to an intermediary to sell it to them. And maybe that's a more dynamic market, but there might be uh, transaction costs and other ways that makes it more complicated. But let's talk about other ways you could apply this to, and one would be fuel. Okay, we have a fuel shortage right now, or or at least a price problem. Um, but what if we said we want to have a fuel shortage in the future? We want to reduce the amount of gasoline sold in our jurisdiction. Then you divide th that into shares and distribute to the citizens. Um, and you could do a point of sale where uh, when people are refueling there's a, a set of, of credits or uh, points associated under the budget, under the, under the cap. That would go down each year. Um, people who use theirs up would need to buy it from other people. People that uh, ride their bikes every day don't need that and they can just get the money. So they get paid for that. Uh, how about in water? California is in a big drought. The Western US is facing long-term drought. Um, sure, there's rationing, but maybe you could do it in such a way where you're actually rewarding uh, conservers, and that could maybe be done through the water bill as well, but maybe in uh, just a more long-term um, balanced way um, instead of just sort of ad hoc, oh, sorry, it was a bad rain. We didn't get much rain this year. Now let's institute a somewhat arbitrary rationing system year by year. Maybe you want to set a long-term cap. Okay, miles. Uh, the issue is if, if you're, say your car is getting better and better mileage, you're, you're driving a Prius now, but hey, I have a Prius, now I wanna go on long road trips because it's cheaper for gas. Well, the more miles you're driving, you're still impacting the environment. So maybe you wanna reduce vehicle miles traveled and you set a cap over that for your jurisdiction. And then that could actually be uh, managed through your insurance company because um, they're, 
starting to do things like telematics and uh, pay for what you need insurance, there might be a way to do mile share that way. Okay, now we're gonna get a little more, we're getting uh, uh, over halfway through my presentation. So I'm gonna start getting a little more controversial maybe about diet and meat protein and some of the environmental impacts that eating meat has. Uh, don't take my word for it, the internet can, can tell you more about that. But um, one idea would be maybe to encourage uh, more fruits and vegetables or something like that. And uh, you can uh, have this be run through a supermarket uh, situation um, and other kind of public health uh, issues could also be addressed. Um, and I mean, in the abstract, it sounds really crazy, but when you think about it, if people are eating 200 and something pounds of meat a year, maybe we wanna reduce that to 180 pounds a year. You're still getting a lot, right? You, you might reduce 10% or 20% and we could test and see what kind of health uh, benefits might accrue. It might save us billions of dollars in hospital bills. And before COVID, you know, heart disease and these other issues were a major killer of Americans. We're talking about a killer of Americans, folks. I'm trying to frame this as a, in a different way. Uh, okay, and then flight share, this is the last one I have. And it's, in a way, I'm looking at kind of reverse frequent flyer miles in a way. That's not how, you know, when I look at other people and they're like, oh, I'm traveling, 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 and COVID's over, now we're going to travel again. But there's a lot of impacts on that. And, and there might be different ways to do this. Um, but uh, we're talking about reducing aggregate air travel uh, in order to save the planet or other environmental impacts that people might care about. And I'm, I haven't really fully defined this one yet. So I put a couple different ways it could work. Um, maybe limiting the number of airplanes in the region, limit of airport size, number of flights, or the number of flights for an individual. And that would be the re reverse frequent flyer. So just putting ideas out there right now, still brainstorming the flight share one. Um, but the idea is people get paid and, and some of this could turn into a portion of a basic income if we have resources uh, like that out there. Um, and, and versions are happening, not exactly as I described, but if you look up climate dividends, uh, there's uh, Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland uh, has had a bill in, in recent past about that. Um, in, in terms of water, there's a lot going on with rationing in California. Vehicle miles traveled, there's a California road charge pilot that you can check out. I don't have links to all these, but if you email me, I'll, I'll let you know. And Denmark did a meat tax. And there's a bunch of groups looking to prevent airports from expanding. So there's things that are kind of in the works on this stuff, but not exactly set up as a cap and share model. Um, as I get to the end here, I do want to mention, OK, I understand that this might challenge the American dream, the American way of life, the open road, uh, infinite, infinite everything. <laughs> Uh, we have an obesity thing going on, you know, so it's kind of like we have to we have to look at is this infinite everything uh, the right thing to do or do we need to kind of limit our approaches to take future generations and the global south and equity into account. So um, I mentioned AOC wants to take away your hamburgers. That was actually argued in Congress against the Build Back Better bill and the Green New Deal is they're like they want to take away your hamburgers. So I'm not taking it away. I'm just trying to set up a level playing field for everyone about it. Um, and it, it does raise questions about what is freedom, what, what's the role of markets versus rationing. Um, there's a lot of concern. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. I, I raised a lot of questions, I'm sure. Uh, happy to talk more about it. Uh, happy to connect with other activists. We're having a great time at this conference. So thanks again. I'm going to stop sharing. Let's see, did it work? Oh, that's my, I think I did it before I clicked yeah. my contact information, but I'll just put it in the chat and I'll, uh, yeah, we'll just is that okay? Turn it over. To okay, great. Yeah. Brent, Thank uh, you, Mike. All, all over to you, Brent. Oh, I think. There we go. Can you hear me now? Very good. All right. Uh, so the, the topic of the paper that I'll be presenting is it's about how to do carbon pricing right. It's the product of research done while uh, writing my book about Commonwealth dividends. And I do have a, a visual here. Um, and of collaboration with Mike and Jim and others, including Peter Barnes, who first popularized the idea of carbon dividends 
And this group has convened loosely under the auspices of FASTA, and we've developed some materials that we're using and reaching out to legislators and their aides to advocate for smart carbon pricing. Um, let me share my screen now, share my slides. All right. Um, so this talk, this talk is a walkthrough of what we consider best practices based on those materials. Uh, through conversation, we hope to gain support for best practices and also to refine the list of best practices. So we welcome your, your questions and comments in the Q&A portion. And of course, feel free to reach out anytime after the session as well. So the first point is, put a price on carbon. This is the polluter pays principle, and it's also common sense. We need to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. And the obvious way to do that is to make fossil fuels progressively more expensive. It might seem unnecessary to belabor this point, but there are some climate activists who say they're opposed to carbon pricing. Usually what this means, uh, this appears to mean is that they're opposed to some specific vision of carbon pricing. And you, if you ask what is the alternative to carbon pricing, you might get answers like investment and spending, like the Green New Deal, or command and control regulations to shut down fossil fuels and force the transition to renewables. Um, and to this, we say, absolutely, we need investment and spending on new infrastructure, and we need other active government uh, interventions and policies and smart regulations, including regulations to ensure that disadvantaged communities aren't actively harmed by the decarbonization process, which has happened in some places. Um, but none of that changes the fact that we also need to put a rising price on carbon. Decarbonization will involve hundreds of billions of purchase and investment decisions by billions of individuals and households and businesses. Um, it's impossible for government to micromanage all of those decisions with command and control regulation. If you want those decisions to be aligned in the direction of decarbonization, you have to be sending a price signal. <clears throat> the second point concerns the first important decision to be made when designing the carbon pricing policy, cap or tax. And this is where we part ways with the Citizens Climate Lobby, though we're very impressed with so much that they've done in their promotion of fee and dividend. Um, the two options are to regulate quantities of emissions and let markets determine the price of carbon, or to regulate the price of carbon and let markets, markets determine the quantities of emissions. Since the goal is to reduce emissions, the better option is to regulate emissions and let markets determine the price. And that means setting up a cap and permit system and gradually reducing the number of permits. For those who do like the idea of a gradually increasing carbon tax, it's actually very easy to incorporate that into the cap-based approach. Carbon permits are to be sold at auction, as I'll discuss in a minute, and the auction can and should include a floor price, and that floor price can, if desired, be set to exactly match the rising carbon tax price envisioned by Citizens Climate Lobby or other advocates. What you would get is a system where, at minimum, the price of carbon is what the carbon tax advocates want, and where the price is also free to rise based on market conditions, however high it needs to go to actually achieve science-based emissions reduction targets. Third, as already mentioned, in a cap and permit system, you need periodic auctions to allocate the permits. Uh, it isn't difficult to design a good auction system. Uh, I have a blog post on this topic on the FASTA website. You need the process to be simple and transparent, so all participants are on equal footing. You need the auctions to be held frequently enough that prices can change to reflect market conditions. And fourth, as already mentioned, there should be a rising floor price on the auction permits, and there should be no ceiling price. Fifth and sixth, these are well-established principles that only need a brief mention. Fossil fuels should be regulated upstream at the wellhead or the coal mine or the national border, wherever they enter the economy. We're talking about regulating a few thousand companies at most in the US, and that's entirely feasible. The higher cost will be passed on to the consumer either way, but regulating upstream makes a lot more sense than regulating downstream at the level of the consumer. And there need to be border adjustments to prevent carbon pricing from putting domestic industry at a competitive disadvantage. There will be a surcharge on fossil fuels and carbon intensive goods like steel and concrete arriving from other nations to put them on a level playing field inside our country. And there will be a subsidy for fossil fuel and carbon fossil fuels and carbon intensive goods that are exported to keep them competitive outside our country. If our trading partner also has a carbon pricing program of their own, the surcharges and subsidies will be prorated or eliminated entirely. And when I'm saying we here, I have the US in mind since that's where I am based, but the same principles obviously could be applied in any country. Seventh, and some people might find this controversial or surprising, we say there should be no trading of permits, no secondary markets for carbon permits. Allowing trading can create opportunities for gaming and speculation. The only real valid reason to allow trading is for efficient allocation of permits. 
but a well-designed auction system already does that. The famous cap and trade bill that was debated in the US Congress in 2009 needed to allow permits to change hands because it didn't rely solely on auctions to allocate the permits. The 2009 bill proposed basically to give away most of the permits for free in a manner determined by legislative whim, which seems incredible now in hindsight, it was just such a terrible idea. Um, this is not to say that it is impossible to design a fair system for trading permits. What we are saying is that such a system is unnecessary, so it is not worth the headache and the risks uh, involved in trying to set it up and keep it fair, as well as the optics as well. Um, all you need is a good auction system, and that is much easier. Eighth, I think most serious observers would agree at this point that there should be no provision for offsets. Offsets are seemingly eco-friendly things that carbon users can do in place of buying a permit like planting trees. Experience has shown that offset systems are rarely effective and that they are susceptible to abuse. We're not saying that people shouldn't go out and plant trees. We're saying that activities like these should be undertaken in addition to reducing emissions, not instead of it. Ninth, we come to the question of what to do with the revenue raised by the carbon pricing system. This is the revenue raised by sale of carbon permits, plus or minus the net revenue from the border adjustments. The two main contending proposals are to spend the money on urgent public priorities related to climate change and to, to refund the revenue back to households as carbon dividends, which is, of course, the, the topic of this conference, the dividends. Uh, we strongly support the latter approach, and here we see eye to eye with Citizens Climate Lobby. A carbon pricing policy that is truly effective in reducing emissions on a schedule to meet science-based targets will raise fossil fuel prices far above where they are today, even in jurisdictions that have carbon pricing pilots. Returning the revenue raised by the carbon pricing system back to households is not only a politically savvy move that will help keep the public on side, it will also be economically necessary to keep many or most low and middle income households financially afloat during the decarbonization transition. Recycling the carbon pricing revenue back to households on a per capita basis will turn the carbon pricing system, which is regressive on its own, into a progressive income recycler. This is not to say that government should not also be spending money on urgent public priorities related to climate change. Of course, the government should also be doing that as well. But there are lots of ways to pay for that, including taxation, borrowing, and new money creation. The recent infrastructure bill in the U.S. has shown that Green New Deal priorities can be funded without tapping into carbon permit revenue. Finally, it's a relatively small point, but we recommend that carbon permits be considered taxable income. This is another way to ensure that the carbon pricing and dividend system is progressive rather than regressive, and it can help governments recoup some of their own higher energy costs. So in summary, what we're proposing is not cap and trade. It's not tax and dividends. We might call it cap auction dividend protect. Put a hard cap on fossil fuels, within that cap auction non-tradable permits, issue the proceeds as universal dividends, and do it in a smart way that protects vulnerable communities, including communities dependent on the fossil fuel economy that need to retool, and communities that could be affected by co-pollutants. And we'll hear more about that in the next paper. And here are some links in case you'd like to see more about the ideas in this presentation. Um, so uh, that's the end of my presentation. So uh, we're gonna switch gears now and um, um, and what this third presentation, which I, I'll be reading, is uh, excerpts from Environmental, Environmental Justice, Carbon Pricing, and Universal Income, a paper in progress by, uh, by Jim Boyce, Michael Ash, and myself. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, um, Michael and especially Jim um, did the lion's share of the work for this paper, so I, I can't take that much credit for it. Uh, but I did make the choices of which um, which expert excerpts to read. So if it's a little bit disjointed, I'll, I'll take the blame for that. But I do encourage everyone to check out the paper in progress, which is it should be available through a link on the, the session page. Um, uh, so what I'll actually do is to read the conclusion, which gives a good overall summary of the argument of the paper, and then I'll read a couple of excerpts from the body of the paper. Okay, so... Carbon pricing is not an end in itself, but rather a logical consequence of any serious commitment to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Starting from the moral premise that the gifts of nature belong equally to all, this paper seeks to reconcile the twin goals of climate protection and environmental justice. We are convinced that there is no intrinsic conflict between the two. On the contrary, they can and should go hand in hand. Translating this compatibility into practice, however, has proven difficult. 
Many economists and other proponents regard carbon pricing as a vital instrument in the climate policy toolkit, whereas many EJ advocates, uh, environmental justice advocates, view the idea with suspicion or downright antipathy. The reasons for their skepticism cannot be dismissed lightly, for the record of past carbon pricing policies has left much to be desired. And their fears about being dealt out in the coming energy transition, replicating the environmental injustices of the previous era, are entirely legitimate. The key to reconciling carbon pricing with environmental justice, we believe, is to design the policy with this consciously in mind. To this end, we have identified four policy design principles. First, to ensure that carbon pricing meets the climate stabilization objective set forth in the Paris Agreement, the price must be grounded in a hard cap on emissions that declines steadily over time on a trajectory consistent with a net zero target by mid-century. The carbon price that emerges from this cap is not simply a tool for curbing emissions. It is a result of keeping fossil fuels in the ground by strictly limiting their supply. Second, to ensure that carbon pricing reduces disparities and exposure to hazardous air pollutants from fossil fuels, rather than maintaining or exacerbating them, decarbonization targets should be accompanied by targets for improving air quality overall and specifically in EJ communities. This can be achieved by location-specific caps in priority zones or sectors, differentiated carbon prices, regulatory instruments, and enhanced screening and monitoring. Third, to counter the adverse and aggressive impact of carbon pricing on household incomes, carbon permits, up to the declining limit set by the cap, should be auctioned regularly, and most or all of the revenue then returns to the public as equal per person dividends. Most households would come out ahead from this carbon price and dividend policy in sheer pocketbook terms, even without counting the environmental benefits, and low-income households generally would obtain the largest net benefits owing to their smaller than average carbon footprints. Carbon dividends are a form of universal income derived from charging money for use of a scarce resource that we own in common, in this case, the biosphere's limited ability to safely absorb carbon. Finally, to prevent the risks that commoditization would pose to effectiveness and equity, carbon permits should not be tradable and offsets should be prohibited. Trading is completely unnecessary if permits are auctioned rather than given away, and it creates opportunities for market manipulation and speculative activity. In sum, the question is not whether carbon pricing is desirable or not, but whether carbon pricing policies will be designed to be effective and just. We believe this is possible and necessary. All right, so now I'm going to jump up and read a little bit from uh, the section of the paper about principle number four, value nature, don't commoditize it. One objection to carbon pricing voiced by EJ advocates and others is that it commoditizes nature, reducing something that ought to be treated as sacred, the integrity of the planetary ecosystem, into something prosaic or even profane to be bought and sold like soybeans or gold bullion or pork belly futures. There is a crucial difference, however, between valuing nature and commoditizing it. When we fail to put a price on carbon and allow emissions free of charge, effectively, we value the resulting climate impact on present and future generations at zero. This is not treating nature as sacred, it is treating it as worthless. Putting a price on emissions need not turn nature into a commodity any more than installing parking meters along a busy uh, city street turns curb space into a commodity. And I'll, I'll read an excerpt from uh, the section of the paper on principle Number two, target, uh, target emissions of hazardous co-pollutants. A central objection to carbon pricing voiced by EJ advocates has been that by allowing polluters to decide whether, how much, and where to curtail their own emissions, a flexibility that economists hail as one of the policy's main attractions, it may result in continued or even increased emissions of hazardous co-pollutants in EJ communities, perpetuating and widening exposure disparities. Potential adverse impacts on local air pollution, known as the hotspot problem in the environmental economics literature, were the main concern raised by EJ advocates in opposing the introduction of California's cap and trade system for carbon emissions a decade ago. The affairs were dismissed at the time by many cap and trade proponents who assumed that lower carbon emissions would be accompanied by lower co-pollutant emissions across the board, despite local variations. Subsequent events proved that EJ concerns were well-founded Comparing the socioeconomic characteristics of California neighborhoods near cap and trade facilities, many of them electric power plants, Pastor et al. in 2022 found that those showed those that showed least improvement in greenhouse gas and co-pollutant emissions, in fact, seeing absolute increases in both, generally had higher percentages of people of color and low-income households. 
To illustrate how this seemingly counterintuitive increase could occur, the replacement of coal-fired electricity by natural gas plants, which emit less carbon per kilowatt hour, frequently entails not only a change in fuel, but also a change in location. Whereas coal-fired plants tend to be sited relatively far from population centers, gas-fired plants tend to be located in or near to metropolitan areas, often in communities with higher percentages of minority and low-income residents. Overall reductions in emissions can therefore go together with increased emissions for some EJ communities. To address EJ concerns about localized pollution, carbon pricing policy at a minimum should mandate real-time monitoring for pollution levels in vulnerable communities and provide for corrective measures to be implemented when adverse impacts are found. More robustly, clean air and EJ objectives should be incorporated into the policy design by mandating reductions in co-pollutant emissions equal to or greater than the mandated reduction in carbon emissions, particularly in communities identified by an EJ screening tool as currently burdened by disproportionate pollution. This can be achieved through tighter caps, higher carbon prices, more stringent regulatory standards, or a combination of these tools. Co-pollutant concerns are not an argument against carbon pricing or other climate policies. Rather, they are an argument for incorporating clean air and EJ into policy design. And that's where I'll stop. Great, thank you, Brent. Uh, I see that we have two questions. Why don't we go straight to those? And uh, the first is from Max Guinness, who asks, uh, without trading, would the auction have to be effectively real time? Uh, one. Uh, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I think in California, do they do quarterly auctions? Um, so I think you can do quarterly and that should cover it. What were you going to say, uh, Brent? Yeah, well, I think quarterly is is a, a common vision. Um, so it, it is important. So if there's no trading, the auctions have to be the main mechanism for establishing the price. So they have to occur frequently enough to, to capture um, changes in market conditions. Um, but there, there are other ways as well. So, so it might be quarterly, could be even more frequently. Um, and if auctions are conducting electronically and the kind of auction that we're talking about here uh, could very easily be conducted electronically, um, there, there's no practical limit on, on how often it could be held. I mean, it could even be held daily. Um, but there, there are other mechanisms as well, what's called banking and borrowing. So that, that uh, provide participants some assurance that if they purchase uh, too many permits in one period, that they can continue to use those permits in the next period, for example. Um, so there, there are mechanisms. Um, and, and they've so had some that's... issues. They've had some issues with banking because in California, uh, there's a lot of uh, backlog banked permits from the previous 2020 uh, se section of the, and when, when they were moving into their 2030, the question was how much of those banked allowances should be allowed to be moved into the 2030 portion of the program. So there's a lot of growing pains in the cap and trade world around this. And, uh, but I think we're actually trying to simplify the program. <laughs> um, I think there's some benefits to reducing the amount of churn that would go on and the amount of speculation. I think that's the idea is we just want the regulated companies to purchase what they need at the time they need it. And that's the price and not have all this other fluctuations that are not ne really necessary to what our goal is here. Um, a related question from Peter Knight, uh, with no market in permits, how does one allow for new entrants to carbon markets or exits of failing firms? I, I think the, the answer to this one is, is is really the same as the answer to the last one. That that uh, you know if if you um, if the auctions are held frequently enough that you're not holding huge you know batches of, of, of permits that last a whole year. You're, you're talking about something quarterly, monthly, weekly, uh, even daily. Um, a new entrant just jumps into the next auction, um, and a, a failed firm you know they're not holding so many permits when they fail that um, that it disrupts the market. And um, I think auctions can avoid that, the problem of the sort of pre-allocation or um, they called it either benchmarking or grandfathering. 
which is what a lot of the cap and trade programs were trying to do. Benchmarking would be they would take market share in an industry and provide free permits to companies according to their market share. That actually hurt new entrants. They, and then another way of doing it would be grandfathering where, yeah, you're just giving, you said your emissions were this much last year. We're going to give you that many permits this year. Or eventually they said, oh, eventually we'll start reducing that amount and give you 90% of what you need or 80% and you have to buy the rest. That's the idea. We, we're, we've been promoting 100% auctions since 2006. So we're not, we didn't just come about 100% auction. We're, we've been saying it the whole time. That's the best way to get a, a price signal. And there's just been a lot of concern about um, trade exposed industries and leakage. So the idea that companies would just shut down and move to Nevada, like in California, they just close their California plant and move to Nevada. But I don't think the carbon price is the main reason for that. If you look at housing prices or other issues relating to the workforce, I think those far outshadow a carbon price at this point. Um, Maybe at some point, if carbon prices get above $100 a ton and you're a cement plant, that could be a problem. But I think for where we are right now, uh, we're just trying to create a carbon price and return the money back to people. And if the dividend was really obvious, then the population would support that and would allow for a higher carbon price. So that's the virtuous circle that Michael Howard and Peter Barnes and other folks have been talking about is that when the dividend is obvious to the public, we've got to make it as obvious as gas prices. So there's a number that's publicized that's on your street corner or whatever. <laughs> You're going to be getting this kind of dividend. And that's where the public support can come for a carbon price. So I think that's the idea. Right now, I think it's carbon pricing is pretty limited for the most part to economists and folks like us that care about this stuff, some environmentalists, but other environmentalists are opposed to carbon pricing. So we're trying to heal that gap between the EJ concerns and the carbon pricing concerns and build that. But really, we want to get everyone excited about receiving a climate, the big goal. And I, I do want to say a good thing about Citizens Climate Lobby is they are bringing all kinds of folks to the table and, and having more conversations about dividends. And I've run into Citizens Climate Lobby folks I live in the Washington, D.C. area, so I've gone to some some uh, public events and citizens climate lobbies there, and I think that's great. So more people we can bring to, to the cause, that's that's a good thing. Yeah, and there has been that that uh, petition that had, I think, over a thousand economists signed uh, endorsing carbon pricing from, you know, across the political spectrum. It was quite a remarkable document. Um, we also have a question from Fred Weber. Um, it is difficult to build capital intensive businesses without long-term stability or predictability in supply prices. Trading allows mechanisms for creating long-term contracts. Thoughts? So I, I have a, a few thoughts here. So one, so um, I, this is a, this is a, an entirely legitimate question and concern. Um, um, but I think that it really speaks to the question of tax or fee versus cap rather than the question of trading or not trading. Um, uh, the, we, 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 we think that cap is better than tax or fee in terms of meeting environmental targets and in other respects as well. The one uh, downside arguably of the cap approach is that it uh, permits volatility in prices. And if we're talking about getting business on board to support the policy and uh, to, to see that their interests are served. If I was running a business, of course, I would want reliable, predictable prices and a, a schedule for an, a increasing um, tax provides that. Um, but it's it's a it's a it's a it's a trade-off there. Um, do we want a policy that will meet the environmental targets and we'll do our best to get business on board, or do we want a policy that uh, business will be happier with? But you know, we'll put it together, we might miss our uh, environmental targets. So there is a trade-off there. When it comes to the question of trading or not trading, um, if the prices will be volatile, um, I don't think trading versus auction really will really make much difference for, for businesses. I think businesses will, will need to adapt either way, whether there's, whether they acquire their, um, uh, whether they acquire permits 
through a trading system or whether they acquire the permits through an auction, um, regardless of how the the cap and dividend system is set up, uh, the cap and permit system is set up. Uh, if you're, um, um, well, I, I think I think I've said everything I, th that I have to say on, on the topic. I hope that answered the question in some way. I'll let someone else speak. Uh, I'll I'll just talk a little bit about the regional green ga greenhouse gas initiative on the east coast and a little bit about the European trading system because for the most part they didn't have a price floor in their first you know ten years or so and the prices usually hovered around the price floor and they were a couple dollars a ton. So there was a price and some money being collected, but it wasn't very high. I think those systems were concerned about causing some major environmental and uh, economic impact. Sorry, um, like you were, like uh, the question was saying. Um, so, so once this, th this would become an issue once the price gets high enough and the price floor would ensure that that got, that, that could get to that point. Um, and then the other issue that came up in Reggie was that um, there was an economic downturn in 2008. And so the cap didn't take that into account. <laughs> and so that that's where they were over allocated. And so you do need to have some flexibility in the cap. And I think you might even want to reduce the cap if COVID hits and no one's leaving their house, travel goes down, the demand is low. Maybe you wanna lower the cap. I mean, you can be flexible in a couple different ways on this with as long as you're keeping in environmental impact in mind you, it's a balance between environmental impact like brent said and and the economic impact and um and then those companies are going to want to have a certain supply of permits to be able to purchase and so the regular auctions can address that um, you can also reserve some california has a reserve um that they hold on to in case the price does skyrocket, they can flatten out that peak. Um, so they have a reserve they can they can um, put out for that. Now that Jim Boyce is a little criti critical of that because it sort of pierces the cap in a way. Um, so it might be one of those things where if you do if you do pierce the cap in some way during a price spike situation, then later you can reduce the cap to make up for it. There's some kind of way you can try to balance that out. Um, but yeah, you might need a Federal Reserve type organization that can change as the economy changes and not just, you don't necessarily want legislators putting in a 20 year system in place based on the political moment. And then things change five years later and you have no way to address that. I and mean, that's where you get into trouble. So. I think hopefully we can have one of those, you know, adaptive management systems in in, in place. Uh, uh, one more thought, which is that if if I were a business owner uh, planning capital investments, um, and I I want predictability, then knowing that something needs to be done about climate change that will have decarbonization, um, um, I think that the, having a carbon pricing system in place, and preferably one that's environmentally effective, so it allows the the it does involve some volatility in carbon prices. I think that would be, uh, so not only the rising carbon price, but also the volatility in price that would be produced by an environmentally effective program of, of cap and permit. Um, all of that would be an incentive to move away from carbon fuels to, uh, to sources of, of energy that have more predictable prices. Um, so, you know, we'll invest instead of, instead of, uh, you know, entering into a long-term contract for uh, for some kind of one, a carbon fuel or another, we're going to build a solar farm. We're uh, unfortunately at the end of our time, um, but uh, I just want to make a couple of closing remarks. I want to thank everybody for attending this session. Uh, the recording of the session will be available when this broadcast ends using the same link used to register and join the session. If you would like to continue the conversation, you can head over to Kumo Space during the break uh, at noon and to meet with other conference attendees and speakers. Um, join us for our morning plenary session, Supporting Babies Ending Poverty, Child Poverty, with remarks from Representative Rashida Tlaib to present the details of the End Child Poverty Act. The session will discuss the arguments for and against giving children or their parents unconditional cash payments. We will also be announcing the winners of this year's high school essay contest. But before that, uh, we have more sessions coming up. So please check out the conference website for the full schedule uh, and see you all later in the day.
thanks to Mike and Brent. Uh, bye bye. Thanks, Mike. And thanks, everyone. Thanks.